My name is Dr Joshua Pollard. I'm a reader in archaeology at the University of Bristol in the UK and one of the co-directors of the Stonehenge Riverside Project. Hi Josh, nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. <laughs> uh, the Nibra disc is found by Lutas. We rescued it uh, with an unbelievable polish sting and uh, now it is in the museum. We proved that authenticity and we find the fine spot and everything is clear now. We do a lot of science on it and uh, what do you think about the Nero disc? Well, it's a remarkable find and I think it's one of those instances where an individual discovery can really transform our understanding of a particular period in prehistory. Um, it's remarkable because it provides direct insight into prehistoric cosmological and astronomical knowledge. It fits in very well with what we understand about um, prehistoric uh, conceptions of um, cosmology elsewhere within the Neolithic and the Early Bronze Age. And I think what's remarkable about the discovery as well and, and, and the, 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 the way that you've been able to uh, analyse the find and publicise the find is the fact that it stimulated so much other work. Um, it's providing a context for enhanced understanding of ritual, of cosmology, within this very important period in Europe's past. And it's a find which showed that the prehistoric people are able to know, knew a lot about archaeoastronomy. Mm -hmm. They look at the heaven and often Stonehenge was brought into this sphere of archaeoastronomy. Mm -hmm. In my point of view, I believe only the winter and the summer solstice. But uh, Stonehenge is an absolutely fascinating find, like the Nibra disc, mm -hmm. but it's not a find, it's a monument. So what is the lastest knowledge about Stonehenge, you know? When, it, when was it erected? When, when does it start and uh, how long it was used? Right. Well, we know that it's a monument that undergoes a, a, a whole series of structural modifications and the first phase of the monument dates to uh, quite close to 3000 BC. Uh, but even from the beginning, it's a monument that has a connection with the winter and with the summer sol solstices. Um, we think as well that there may be uh, a degree of reference to major and minor moon risers and moon sets, but although that's probably the limit of uh, astronomical reference that exists within the monument. Um, we know that the, that the major phase of, of structural change occurs around 2500 BC when the Sarsen Circle, the Sarsen Trilithons are created in the centre of the site, when the blue stones are, are rearranged within rings and then a ring and a horseshoe within the Sarsen Circles. And we also know that it's a monument that continues to be modified on a small scale and continues to be used well into the Early Bronze Age. Uh, the final phase of modification, probably more or less contemporary with the deposition of the Nibra disc. You discovered a new stone circle which don't exist now, but you discovered it at the end of an alley at the River Avon. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us anything about this? It's exciting. Yes, yes, it was a, a, an unexpected discovery. We wanted to know whether or not the avenue that leads from the entrance at Stonehenge continued all the way down to the River Avon, whether or not it had a very direct connection with the river. And what we found was that at the end of the avenue, uh, traces of a small stone circle. We think that the stones that were originally forming that circle were blue stones, which were then subsequently taken to Stonehenge and then after those stones had been removed, the site was memorialised by enclosing the area within a henge earthwork. But, but this is fascinating. So the people erected the blue stones first in this blue stone circle and then they deconstructed and bring it to Stonehenge to re-erect them yes. in a ritual way or what? Yes. Well, it, the, the blue stones represent a very complex story. Um, we suspect that a number of the blue stones uh, may have been present at Stonehenge from its very beginning, from close to 3000 BC. But we suspect that uh, there were other smaller bluestone circles, like Bluestone Henge. There could be other sites as well. We suspect there is a, a, another uh, just to the, to the west of Stonehenge, which hasn't yet been investigated. 
So the, the, the blue stones are, 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 are being moved around, they're being reset, they're being re-erected in various configurations. But what's interesting is the fact that eventually they end up being brought into Stonehenge. It's a, it's a monument that condenses other monuments. And what about this alley, you know, the connection to the Nibra disc is the orientation to the summer and the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. And there's an alley exactly on the line uh, of the summer and winter solstice. And you can see in the landscape mm -hmm. a, a banquet or something like this, you know, exactly in this direction. And uh, as I, I, I read uh, that this was made by man and I, you discovered this is natural. Yes, that was perhaps the, the, the biggest surprise. Uh, it's always been assumed that the, that the first part of that avenue, the one that has the uh, alignment on the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset, was entirely artificial. Uh, but we were able to demonstrate that, in fact, uh, it represents a, a modification of a natural feature of bridges of harder chalk, of, of different geology, which just fortuitously happens to have a, a solstitial access. So maybe the people discovered that this natural phenomenon, this natural signal in the landscape, which is exactly on the line of the winter and summer solstice, that uh, this is the perfect place for a ritual place. So maybe this is the reason to build Stonehenge. I, I think it's quite likely. Uh, it must have been a, a feature that excited considerable interest once people recognised that it had a solstice axis. It must have been imbued with all sorts of, of power and, and quality. And it's perhaps not surprising that therefore we, we have one of Europe's great prehistoric monuments created at one end of this feature. You know, we in the middle of Germany had a lot of offerings. The people offered axes and daggers to the gods. Mm -hmm. And as I see in Stonehenge, axes and daggers are depicted as a picture on the stones. Is this a, an other form of offering or what? Yes, I, I think you could see it as a form of offering, um, but by, by actually sort of inscribing an image onto the stone, it, it, it's almost an act which is, is transferring something of the qualities of those objects to the monument itself, and, and presumably not just to the monument, but to ancestors or to deities who, who are, are seen to be sort of embodied within the structure of the monument. A fascinating thing is that you found a pit, and in the pit are all the bones of the cremated people found by the archaeological campaigns at the beginning of the last century. Mm -hmm. So what is the relation between cremations, between burials, between dead people and Stonehenge? Well, there are a remarkable number of late Neolithic cremation burials from Stonehenge. Um, there are very few late Neolithic cemeteries within the British Isles. Um, Stonehenge is is one of a handful of sites where we have large numbers of burials. Um, it tends to suggest that it's, it's exceptional on, on those grounds alone. Um, it, we're obviously in the very early stage of analysing all the cremated remains which have been recovered through the excavations, but already it looks as though we've got a, 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 a very skewed population, mostly comprising adult males. It's easy to imagine that these may be people from a particular lineage, um, a lineage that, that sees uh, itself as, 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 as owning or controlling Stonehenge. Um, so perhaps a late Neolithic elite. The people who built Stonehenge are part of Stonehenge, maybe the stone face of Stonehenge, could be related to the continent because you found the Amesbury Archer. He's a bell beaker man who, who traveled around Europe, as we see by the Stronsum isotopes. You have the Bosco Bowman. So uh, what is the relation between the continent and Stonehenge? Well, the, the, the clearly connections, as, as you say, you know, we now have direct evidence for um, long distance human movements. We have evidence that, uh, although we previously thought about the British late Neolithic as being very insular, um, we're now beginning to realise that, uh, that, that, that there must have been contact. Um, the fact that uh, you are now discovering similar monuments, similar kinds of ceremonial architecture here in, 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 in middle Germany, 
um, suggests that there may be shared traditions, there may be knowledge which is being sort of passed over long distances. And perhaps it's, it's that component of distance which is, is adding weight and value to that esoteric knowledge. On my point of view, the problem in Stonehenge is that a lot of people dig a lot of small holes over more than a century. And so a lot of the, the, the possible archaeology is disturbed by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. and there are also reconstructions at the beginning of the 19th century. So and at the beginning of the 20th century. So we can't get all full information out of this place. Mm -hmm. And could it help that we discovered a similar place, but only from wood, in Permit uh, near Schönebeck? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, f first of all, we, we as archaeologists feel very frustrated about the fact that uh, it's so difficult to conduct excavations at Stonehenge and we, we know that the only way to resolve many of the issues is to conduct quite large-scale excavations, but the powers that be restrict that. So yes, it's, it's all the more important to um, have knowledge of, of comparable sites, sites which can uh, feed information back into our understanding of, of Stonehenge. And last question, there are more monuments than Stonehenge. There's Woodhenge, there's Durrington Walls. And what is the idea in the moment you have with the colleagues in the project about this ritual landscape? What is the relation between Durrington Walls, Woodhenge, the new blue stone circle and Stonehenge? Well, I think what we're seeing is that although you start off with a, a, a landscape with a series of monuments that might be quite disparate and unconnected. There is a point around 2500 BC, which rather interestingly is a point where we see greater evidence for renewed contact with continental Europe, where certain monuments are, are joined together, they're connected. So Stonehenge is connected to the River Avon with the avenue. Durrington Walls and Woodhenge are created, and they're also connected to the River Avon um, via similar earthwork avenues. So we can see that these sites begin to work as a single complex. They are acting as a single monument, if you like, which we believe um, related to a, a large ritual cycle. Um, probably most of the activity taking place around uh, the midwinter solstice and activity that may have celebrated uh, both the renewal of life but also the translation of, of the newly dead into ancestors. So we have this remarkable moment where an entire landscape is, is, is uh, worked in order to facilitate uh, a single um, set of ritual practices. Wonderful. Thank you very much, George. Okay, thank you.